starting today, our company is now Meta. 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 Meta has lost $9.4 billion this year. It's already down uh, about 50%. Be cutting around 10,000 jobs. We really haven't been satisfied with the pace of progress. What is the future of VR? My first experiences in a VR headset made me feel like a kid again. It felt different. It felt new. I've even developed my own experiences for VR. But the recent news for VR has not been positive. Despite improving tech and gaming experiences, sales for the Quest Pro, Pico headsets, and even the widely impressive PSVR 2 have lagged. Meta, the behemoth behind Quest 2, has laid off thousands, and many are questioning whether VR can truly be a gaming success. So I sat down with Bastian Olai, the lead developer for VR, AR, and XR for the Gato Engine, to learn more about the future of VR, the power of indie games, and his advice for those of you wanting to learn game development. So you, you work a lot within uh, XR, VR. Have you always kind of worked within XR, VR, AR? No, um, it was XR that brought me back. I got the message from a friend of mine who you know knew what i was doing and said well you know if you don't want to build all these things you just want to concentrate on xr why don't you you know um try out this engine called godot because it's open source and you can just use the engine and you can build the part that you're passionate about and that you're interested in do you have a, a favorite ar xr vr experience that you've had um that one's really really hard to answer in the early days of vr i actually started with the playstation vr that was the first vr proper vr headset that i bought for me one of the pivotal moments that that i really knew that this was going to be something was when i played the rogue one add-on that they had built there was like a, a rogue one tie-in where you had the single level where you play, um, where you fly an X-Wing fighter through a, a small little level. It's really well done. But starting that up, suddenly you're booted into this game and you have this life-sized at at walker walk past. Mm. And the difference in experience between seeing that on a normal screen and seeing that in VR and suddenly looking up and looking and seeing how big this thing is and getting a sense of scale, that for me was probably the moment where I sort of went like, okay, this is offering something that nothing else can. The opening scene in Half-Life Alex, where you start on the rooftop and you have this vista of a city and you have these big things suddenly going overhead. The sense of scale and the sense of realism that comes with that, that is one of the two core elements of what makes VR special to me. The other one being the fact that you can interact with your hands and that you actually interact with your environment. Those are things you can't replicate on desktop. You can't replicate with a non-VR game. Probably if you look at a lot of the sort of technological advances with, with entertainment and media, how Star Wars is sounding this line that goes through everything, right? Um, oh, yes. Yeah, people often forget you're actually rendering at double the resolution of what these headsets display because of the whole lens distortion effect that needs to be applied. You're not rendering at this at a normal 60 frames per second, what most games want to reach. Um, you need to hit 90 frames per second and preferably run higher. And then you're doing it twice because you got two eyes. And when you look at the Quest 1, I'm comparing it to a PlayStation 1, basically. Maybe just getting to PlayStation 2. Quest 2 is really in that PlayStation 2 realm. And what we've seen so far is, with a couple of exceptions of people who are really into it and got really into it very early and started to experiment with it and started to find out what makes VR special, most of the things that are currently still coming out are, hey, I have a game that I love to play on desktop. I'm going to make that same experience in VR. And that doesn't necessarily, you know, it can be a very good experience, but it doesn't necessarily make the VR game anything that that is, that offers the player more than the desktop version. Comparing to those people that, you know, that really have been doing VR for a couple of years now and starting to find out like, hey, these are the sort of experiences that can only be done in VR. The big question at that point in time is, okay, how do you now sell that to the audience? Beat Saber for me is, is still the quint example, uh, essential example of that, is a game that got it so right. So it's just such a simple concept, but it got it so right. This is something you can only do in VR 
that became the game that everybody who did buy into VR started showing their friends. And they had a friend over and like, hey, I've got a VR headset. You gotta, you gotta try this out. Ah, mm -hmm. VR, it's just a hype. I'm not gonna try. Just tr try this thing called Beat Saber. I haven't met a single person, including people who don't play games, that I have given my quest to and said, here is Beat Saber, go and try this, mm -hmm. who haven't been woke by it and suddenly went like, oh, this is actually really interesting. A lot of, especially indie studios who don't have the budget to do this level of optimization that is required to make VR games run fluidly when you when you have this level of um, of fidelity, they just go the other way. You know, you look at uh, uh, Beat Saber, uh, it's, it's all fake effects, mm -hmm. but it's a game that makes the best use of what VR has to offer. Um, Super Hot is a good example as a game that completely went to a stylized approach because you know, that works in this environment. You can hit your high frame rates. It doesn't affect the level of gameplay. To be exact, it might actually enhance the gameplay because they're not worried about, you know, making everything photorealistic and, and putting effort into that. They're putting mm. the effort into making the game uh, play nicer. It shows you that in the right hands, you know, it can look good, even though you're that constrained. Then again, you know, as a, as a game developer, I also start recognizing the techniques that they're using, right? The same sort of techniques as was using, like, like look at look at Uncharted or, you know, The Last of Us, which is a great example, which was a PlayStation 3 game originally and looked amazing. And why did it look amazing is because Naughty Dog knows how to make amazing things work. Mm -hmm. fast because they know they know all the tricks of the book and and i think that this is also a problem that indie game development has is they expect game engines to do that for them they just expect to just throw a whole bunch of things at the game engine and, and the game engine will make it run fast and while you know unreal 5 gets close with how much intelligence <laughs> sits in that game engine to to let you do really dumb things and it's still performing you know for 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 the rest of us if you don't know what you're doing, hmm. any game engine can can be uh, you know can can run badly. Uh, what advice would you have uh, to to someone who is on that cusp of of game development and maybe questioning whether it's something that's worth their time? Uh, the number one mistake that I see people, including myself, make time and time again is to get into game dev with the idea. I have this big game idea and I'm going to build this game. They've bitten off way more than they can chew and they gave up on their dream. Start with a small goal. Don't try and make that big game idea that you have. Put that big game idea that you have on paper by all means and then look at each individual scale, skill set and, and build something small that just focuses on one thing. So attending things like game jams, um, it does two things for you. First of all, it forces you to make something small. Second thing is, especially you know once you go back to game jams that are physically held the nice thing or at least my experience with the game jams that i've attended to is that you tend to to get to know a couple of these people and you join forces for the duration of a game jam and you can just team up with a bunch of people that you've already you know if you've gone to a few of these game jams in a row and you've already been befriended just for that one project that has to be finished in two or three days or whatever the duration of the game jam is. First of all, create the connections with people that when you are finally ready to make that bigger thing, that you know who you have previous pleasant experiences with working and who also know you and aren't going like, I've got this great game idea, I'm a programmer, who is going to help me? And everybody's going like, who are you? Uh, and, and the same is also, can, you know, being a part of like the Godot community or being part of the stay at home dev community, right? You're, you're communicating with these people who have similar goals than you. And sometimes it's no more than giving each other advice. And sometimes it's suddenly like, Hey, here's someone who's doing this thing. I need that for my game idea. And this person is a friend. So I actually feel comfortable talking to that person and saying, Hey, I'm working on this, you know, are you willing to help? While VR may hit more bumps in the future, what is clear is that VR has made an impact. Whether this impact lasts is likely up to independent developers willing to make the leap to VR, who are also ready to challenge the expectations of gamers against those who seek to monetize and control it.